Razer didn't surprise anyone when they released the new Razer Blade with better hardware and identical build quality to its predecessor. It was the massive price drop that got me and a lot of others excited about it. But apparently Gigabyte doesn't think they went low enough. Gigabyte figures they can do the same thing for 600 US dollars cheaper for a 512 gig model. Wow. And this is it. The Aero 14, or as I'm calling it, the poor man's blade. MassDrop is currently featuring their exclusive K7XX red headphones built by AKG. Learn more and buy one today at the link in the video description. Let's start with specs. It would be easy to put a Core i5 with onboard graphics in this thing and say, hey, look, it's cheaper. So you can't call something a Blade competitor unless it's similarly equipped. So like the Blade 14, my config of the Aero 14, more on that later, rocks a Core i7 6700HQ, 16 gigs of DDR4 memory, an M.2 SSD, and a GTX 970M graphics card, though it has 3 gigs versus 6 gigs of VRAM. Which leads us pretty well into the differences, because while raw system performance should be pretty darn close in some ways, in others the experience will be pretty different. For starters, the SSD in my config is SATA instead of NVMe, in spite of the product page's PCIe messaging right at the top. On to the power brick. In spite of its slightly lower rated output, it's a touch bigger, but it includes a 2.1 amp USB port, which is a super convenient feature for regular travelers. Next is I.O., where it's hard to declare a true winner. The Aero 14 rocks three USB 3 5 gigabit type A ports, just like the Blade, adds a USB 3.1 10 gigabit port on its type C port, but it sacrifices Thunderbolt on that same type C connector. And then it gets more complicated. They both have HDMI, but the Aero 14 has HDMI 2.0 for 60 Hertz 4K output and a mini display port for easy conversion to anything, including VGA, making up for some of the functionality lost by that Thunderbolt port that's missing. And then finally, and if this isn't a home run, it's a ground rule double for sure, the Aero 14 has an SD card reader. Woohoo. Moving on to the display, the Aero 14 has what Gigabyte very optimistically refers to as a 3K. 14 inch IPS display with an actual resolution of 2560 by 1440, which I've usually heard referred to as 1440p or 2.5k, which is only about 64% the number of pixels as the Blade 14's 3K Plus display. But, deceptive product marketing aside, I think this is a great move. At this size, it doesn't appreciably affect the sharpness of text or other on-screen elements, and it contributes directly to better battery life and longer battery life when gaming at the panel's native resolution. It's not as bright as Razer's display, and the huge chin bar reminds me of notebooks from years past, but it's got DC backlight modulation, that's why it's not flickering in our B-roll, and a matte finish with strong contrast performance that makes it look really good in person. I did miss the touchscreen quite a few times, and G-Sync or higher refresh rates would be on the wish list for an Aero 2, but these features would add cost and device thickness, so overall, I'm not complaining here. On the subject of thickness, Whatever Gigabyte might think about this, the Blade 14 continues to be the obvious competitor here. And while you could convince me that the Aero 14 is the same size if it had been a couple of weeks since I'd seen a Blade, side by side the difference is noticeable. The Aero 14 is about 15% larger by volume, most of which is due to its increased thickness. But once again, this is a matter of trade-offs rather than an opportunity for me to declare a clear winner. For your extra thickness, you get socketed memory slots, two of them, allowing the Aero 14 to be upgraded to 32 gigs of 
off-the-shelf RAM. This A-Pacer stuff that I had lying around from an ad spot a while ago worked great, making it a shockingly well-equipped workstation competitor. You get a second M.2 slot for an additional storage drive, with RAID support by the way, and you get a whopping 90 plus watt hour battery that translated into a huge real world battery life advantage at the same screen and keyboard backlight brightness. Speaking of the keyboard, Gigabyte also makes a point of mentioning the super long key travel in their marketing materials, but frankly, I don't think it contributed anything here. I mean, the good news is that it didn't hurt the experience either. The force required to type is a little bit heavy for my tastes, but I did get used to it in a few days, and at this point, I feel like the keyboard, uh, with the well-positioned macro keys contributing significantly here, is a strong point for this device in spite of its monochromatic backlighting and missing right function key that makes one-handed volume adjustments a bit more of a chore. As for the touchpad, it's not the best I've ever used, but I've been using this thing daily for over two weeks now, and it's yet to make me upset, so very good marks for both of these. On to overall build quality, the one finger 180 plus degree hinge is really nice. The speakers are very loud and very clear, but sound like they're coming from somewhere else due to their position on the bottom of the device. The built-in webcam isn't anything special, and there's more chassis flex than premium products like Dell's XPS 15, Apple's MacBook line, and yes, that comparison again, the Blade 14 but nowhere near the Gigabyte notebooks of old that I refused to review because I could bend them into a boomerang shape with minimal effort. And you are saving a few bucks here, so I don't mind making some concessions when it comes to overall robustness. But what about performance then, Linus? Well, as long as it doesn't thermal throttle, this hardware combo shouldn't shock us. So the only real difference here comes into play if you insist on playing at native resolution. So make of that then what you will. On the subject of thermals, it's trade-off time again. The Aero 14 manages to be quieter than the Blade 14 under load, and I'm thinking this is in no small part due to its much less restrictive exhaust vent under the screen, but it suffers from noticeably higher keyboard and touchpad temperatures at idle. Then while gaming, its touchpad is actually four degrees cooler, but its keyboard, which you're more likely to be touching while you're gaming, because you'll probably be using an outside mouse, is four degrees hotter. Add to that though, that the components inside the Blade 14 generally run hotter, and it becomes a question of personal preference, at least if you have enough to afford either one. Which leads us then into the conclusion. I don't like some of Gigabyte's sketchy claims. 3K display, all those callouts for M.2 NVMe RAID, when my config, the only one available in the States at the moment, has a single 512 gig M.2 SATA drive. And I don't understand why they felt the need to behave this way, because there's no need to stretch the truth for the Aero 14 to be a fantastic machine. It does that on its own. It gives up some build quality. It gives up a touchscreen and an RGB backlit keyboard and Thunderbolt, and it is a little bit bigger than the Blade 14. But it offers up significantly better battery life, HDMI 2.0, an SD card reader, more flexible configurations. So I talked about my config, I'd expect to see more in the future. Thanks to two slotted memory and M.2 bays, a two year global warranty and a much lower price. And it does all that while including a USB to Ethernet dongle for folks who prefer wires to killer networking. Wasn't that fun? You know what else is fun? Saving money on your phone bill. Do you ever find yourself going, gee, why is it that I, when I go to the restaurant, I have to order, you know, six cheeseburgers for the week, and then if I don't use four of those cheeseburgers, I just have to throw them in the garbage. I only ate two of them, why can't I just buy two? Well, that is how mobile phone bills work. You have to say in advance, like, oh, I'm probably gonna talk to, you know, people for 227 minutes this month, but then if you only use 226, you paid for something you didn't use. Well, not with Ting. With Ting, you pay for only what you use, and the average Ting bill is only 24 bucks a month per device. 
Just head over to linus.ting.com. We've got it linked in the video description and try out their savings calculator. You enter your last couple of bills and then it spits out, hey, here's how much you would be saving on Ting and boom, you can see if you'd be a happy person. And by the way, data is now just 10 bucks per gig beyond the first gigabyte. Mm, pretty freaking cool. So sign up and you'll get 25 bucks in service credit or towards a new device. Wow. So thanks for watching, guys. If this video sucked, you know what to do. But if it was awesome, get subscribed, hit the like button, or check out the link to where to buy this laptop, which we will have in the video description. Usually it's at Amazon. Also linked in the video description is our merch store, which has cool shirts like this one, and our community forum, which you should totally join so you can talk shop with other tech geeks. Now that you're done doing all that stuff, you're probably wondering what to watch next, so click that little button in the top right to check out our latest video over on Channel Super Fun. Sparkle and Dennis go for a joyride in my car for some reason. Who does that kind of thing? <laughs>